uh, thanks very much for staying so late and you know lo lovely that people have found place in the shade um I, how many people in the audience have kind of recently looked at a piece of code and said who the fuck wrote this okay so um Kind of, I, I recently had to do stuff like that and looked at a piece of code and, and believe me, it's a lot easier to do stuff like that when you're not the only person on the team. And um, I, for the last two years, I've been building a product on my own. Um, previously, I've built kind of products with small teams, but this is like literally just me. So whenever I run into some stupid crap that some idiot wrote, um, and I, w what's it really, this enabled me to do is be very, very critical about how I do stuff and, and have to self-reflect a lot about why I do certain things and what I do because I'm everything from the kind of pre-sales to sales development, product management support, testing and, and production help. So um, it, it's really kind of um, helped me figure out what's important and what's not important and where do I put my effort there. So that, that's kind of what I want to talk about a bit, and uh, this is where the testing in production bit comes in. Because testing in production uh, 10 years ago was a phrase we used to basically poke fun at people who didn't know how to control quality. It's like, ha, ah, these idiots are testing in production. And that basically meant users facing issues and, and having to test for software companies. And I think the, the meaning of that phrase needs to be kind of changed. And that's what I want to kind of maybe inspire you to, to do today. So generally, when we look at testing and the way testing practices have evolved, the um, most recent taxonomy that's kind of been published that is widely accepted is Brian Marek's Agile Testing Quadrants. And Lisa Crispin and Janet Gregory kind of redefined this slightly into um, a version that's become even more popular in their Agile testing book. And basically, they divide stuff into uh, tests that are there to support the team on, on this side, tests that are there to kind of critique the product or support the business, technical and, and kind of business tests. And it's a good taxonomy, but um, that's not the kind of testing I want to talk about. I want to talk about kind of stuff that falls off this picture. And it's kind of the stuff that I, I think we can start looking at and the stuff that is much more interesting for me to look at as I'm kind of building this product. And, and the big question is kind of, you know, what is there? What, what's in this area that falls off this picture? And uh, a kind of a quick answer is mushrooms. And now, now I know what you're thinking, like Goiko's finally gone crazy. Like, he's been at this conference for a bunch of times. He's always talking crazy shit, but this is like, you know, I'm, I'm now behaving like a crazy uncle that is in a midlife crisis and decided that I need to go in the woods and, you know, preach how mushrooms are a cure for cancer and stuff like that. Every family has one. And yes, but um, there's some kind of interesting truth in this. And um, I think that generally mushrooms are a much, much better analogy for the kind of problems and the kind of stuff we do in software than bugs. Because first of all, most mushrooms are kind of meh. They're not really poisonous. They're not really edible. Then you know, there's like a million types of mushrooms. Some mushrooms are kind of horrible. Some mushrooms are okay. And there, there's some mushrooms where you know, once you've eaten them, it all goes crazy. And um, th th there's, um, I've spent too much time preparing for this talk, research in different types of mushrooms. So I can tell you that there's exactly 216 types of hallucinog hallucinog hallucinogenic mushrooms that cause stuff to kind of go a bit crazy. And this is what some of my bugs look like, where I can't believe my eyes. I, I don't know what's going on. Um, a month ago, I had this problem where um, I was getting payment notifications from Stripe, the payment processor I use, for subscriptions that don't exist. It's like, on one hand, it's great. I'm getting money from you know, people who shouldn't be giving me money. On the other hand, there's, there's something really wrong going on here. And I'm kind of couldn't understand what's going on. It was like I'm hallucinating. And then uh, kind of a day later, I started getting hit by chargeback requests for people who kind of didn't want to give me money, and one person paid four times, starting four different subscriptions. He wasn't even registered in my system. And the, the kind of this is insane, and it is one of these hallucinogenic things. And what had happened is Stripe changed the way they deal with failed payments. Um, 
Before that, uh, people click on, yes, I want to subscribe. I send them over to Stripe. Stripe processes the payment. If successful, sends me the data about the payment, I create a subscription, and everything's fine. What they've done is decided that if a payment fails, they're going to tell the user the payment failed, but retry tomorrow. So this person tried subscribing four times. It failed, it failed, it failed, it failed, because he didn't have enough money on the card. Tomorrow, he had enough money on his card, and now four payments came in. And this is one of those really crazy things, because whose bug is this? Is this a bug in my code? Is this a bug in Stripe? Is this? I mean, at the end of the day, the problem is mine, because I'm getting hit by chargeback costs. And this comes back to this, you know, I, I, I'm everything on the line here. Um, but wh where do we fix this problem? And that's a really big kind of um, big uh, problem. So um, part of what's happening here is that I think as applications are moving more and more to interconnected APIs, cloud, and stuff like that, major risks in the applications happen after we deploy. And testing for these things before deployment is pointless because they're not reproducible, they're not necessarily predictable, they're not, and, and this is kind of the kind of testing in production I want to talk about. Stuff that we can't possibly test, or, or is not economical to test, or is not uh, good enough to test, it's not reliable enough to test before we deploy. And those things we can only, only ever kind of attach in production. And this is where kind of mushrooms come in. So um, looking at those mushrooms, um, we, there's a lot of parallels between mushrooms and software problems. And the first big parallel is kind of in the most dangerous types of, of mushrooms out there. So um, the, can anybody guess what the most dangerous type of mushroom is? So the, the most dangerous types of bugs are the bugs that exist in the cloud. Because the bugs that exist in the cloud start connecting with other shit that exists in the cloud, starts interacting with stuff you didn't even know it, you were interacting with. And you can't even trace it because the code is not on your end. And, and a, a, all of that kind of starts exploding. So th this is a, um, a kind of a, not really an image of uh, the, the, this particular mushroom cloud, but the biggest recorded mushroom cloud. I told you I spent too much time researching this. The biggest recorded mushroom cloud was 65 kilometers in diameter. It was created by something called the Tsar Bomba, which translates as a, like an emperor bomb, that the Russians decided to build in, in, in uh, 1961. They only tested one half of it because they couldn't predict what's going to happen if they explode the whole thing. So, um, and, and this is the problem with kind of bugs in the cloud. The blast radius is unpredictable. And the more we interact with, kind of uh, go on the cloud, the more we kind of um, connect with other APIs and other platforms, it speeds up how we develop software. But it can create really, really weird problems that you can't predict. So kind of about um, two years ago, uh, there was uh, this situation where Amazon had an outage and then people couldn't turn on the Christmas lights. How are Christmas lights connected to Amazon? Nobody knows, but hey, you know. Amazon ruined Christmas for some people. So um, it's not just Christmas lights. Some people were stupid enough to kind of install uh, smart doorbells or, or stuff like that. And now um, you, you, and, and kind of install lights that are smart and things like that. So there was you know, this person complaining that they're now in the dark because Amazon is down. And there's this person complaining that you know, other people can't visit them because Amazon's US one region is, is a bit of a kind of hiccup. So um, what, what I'm trying to say is there's lots and lots of this stuff happening all the time. There, there was a year ago um, uh, a problem with these uh, automatic vacuum cleaner robots that all of a sudden stopped working because somebody forgot to renew an Amazon account. And you don't even know about this stuff, and it's insane. It starts affecting us. So the big lesson here is really don't buy a fucking smart doorbell, please. Um, but the other big lesson is if your app is in the cloud, there's a lot of stuff that we, can't, we need to test in the cloud. And, and we need to figure out how to test that and where to test it. And um, what, one of the other kind of problems with these bugs in the cloud is that kind of, um, like, like mushrooms, they tend to connect with other mushrooms and we don't see that. Mushrooms are very rarely a, an isolated, independent uh, entity. So wh when you see a single mushroom, it's usually kind of a whole bunch of them, and they're connected in the ground in really weird ways. And um, this is kind of a, a honey mushroom. I, I, yeah, too much time spent on this. Honey mushroom sounds really, really kind of benign, and, and the Latin name is Armillaria gallica. That sounds like, you know, some kind of 
posh French dish or something like that. But it's actually a, a massively dangerous parasite that attacks uh, the roots of trees. So, you know, this is all a single organism. It kind of connects all underneath. It pulls the ground from the tree. It kind of starts strangling the tree and kills the tree at the end. And this is kind of the problem um, with, with software bugs in the cloud, is they start connecting to one another, and, and you have no idea how that's actually working or, or, or what's happening there. So here's a, a, a screen uh, from a monitoring tool I use uh, for a, th this product of building. And this is an error I, I found in the log um, kind of a few days ago. And what the error is saying is that um, it received a message larger than max. 4, 4 meg 8 instead of 4 meg 1 or something like that. No, I'm totally clueless when I saw this. Started looking at what, what this is, started you know Googling for it, started looking at the code. And it turns out I'm using, uh, the, the product is helping people create narrated videos easily. So it's using text to speech to generate speech. And um, the, Google's official library for interacting with the Google Cloud service for this um, can only receive four megabytes of data back. Now, not documented anywhere. No, no, and and um, they have uh, limits on the data you can send to it, but you send text. That's very easy. When they send voice back, it's kind of difficult to control. And I think the limits that they're doing, you can, I don't know if you can read this, but this is some kind of Russian voice. Apparently, you know, probably with the kind of um, uh, ratio of characters to the length of the voice in this specific Russian voice, the and whatever specific text this user did, it broke the amount of bytes that the API can receive back. And uh, you know, it, it, it's one of these parasitic things that strangled my service and killed it, and I, I don't even understand how this is all connected. And the big problem there is really, um, we can't really predict unknowns like this. There's no documented anywhere. I, probably they don't even know about this. But what I can do is I can spot when these things happen and I can prevent them from happening again. And that's kind of part of why testing in production is important, so that we don't accumulate these things. We, we kind of kill off these mushrooms before they start growing too much. And um, one of the things that kind of is really important is with the whole cloud deployment and microservices and APIs and everything connected to everything, there's a ton of problems happening all the time. On a large volume of requests, some of those requests disconnect because there was a network problem. Some of these microservices in the cloud will die because the machine they're working on died. Some of these things just don't work temporarily because there's a bug on their end. And, and the fundamental question that we have to start asking ourselves is can we tell if some weird shit like this is different from just a random network problem or a random problem on their end? Is this something that I should fix or is this something that will be fixed by them, whoever they are, or is this something that's kind of transient because somebody's on a bad Wi-Fi? Or how do we tell these things? So that's kind of a really fundamental question that I think uh, I had to figure out how to answer. And, and it's a very kind of app-specific thing. So if you want to start testing in production, that's a question that you will start to have to answer for yourself. And kind of the problem with this is really um, how do we capture the data? So there's, there's two types of capturing data fundamentally. And one type that's becoming more and more popular is called structured logging. And structured logging is basically provide some way of exporting the internal state of your application. So it, ca it can be easily queried. It can be easily analyzed by automated tools. So we can figure out, is this problem here something that is on my end, on your end, or you know, magic, or am I hallucinating? And structured logging is, is an emerging practice. And I think the earliest thing I, I've ever heard about this is in Nat Price's and uh, Steve Freeman's wonderful book, Growing Object-Oriented Software, where they talk about how logging should be approached as a first order domain interface to your software. Lots of people approach logging by just throwing some text shit and, and seeing you know, where it goes. But what they're advocating is that's an API to your software. That's a, a uh, you have to design it, you have to figure out what act, uh, you know, how to consume it, how to log it. So there's a lot of this that's going on at the moment. There's a lot of tooling emerging there. The other type is kind of inspection tools that all these kind of providers now provide. And there's no consistency there. Every provider provides different tools. You have to kind of figure out what you do. I use AWS, so AWS has this tool called X-Ray. 
X-ray allows you to trace requests from when uh, AWS received it throughout all their services and figure out where it got stuck and things like that. So we have these two views. We have this internal view of my software and we have an external view of kind of the uh, architecture running it or the infrastructure running it. And the, the important thing is we need to figure out how do we connect all this stuff together. So in, in you know, the analogy of the mushrooms is if a mushroom kind of kills a microservice there, we need something to tell us it's dead. And we need to something to tell us why is it dead and, and, and how it died and things like that. And this is where I've kind of started drawing for myself a useful thing. It looks like quadrants, but I'm not going it's, it's not quadrants, I call it a compass because it's kind of a compass on the map. And it's a kind of testing in production compass. So lots of times when people look at their production system, what they have is monitoring stuff. And monitoring kind of corresponds to the second type of inspection that they showed you this kind of external thing because with monitoring we can monitor our servers live our servers running is my software busy what's the cpu those are kind of external factors of this thing now we also have this other side that's kind of more internal and this is where a buzzword called observability comes in observability is this new relatively new it's been emerging over the last five or six years practice of exposing the internals of the application so it can be analyzed in an automated way easily. And there's a ton of books, there's a ton of papers, I kind of, it's, it's something that I think everybody should start researching more and more. And it's kind of a, a builds upon this kind of structured logging idea. And we also have another dimension here. We have a dimension of are we doing something passively or are we actively researching this stuff? And this is where we have two more types of, of kind of testing in production. So if I'm actively trying to do something, I can poke it in production, I can monitor or I can observe what my software is doing, and then I can conclude if the experiment worked or not. That's a very good way of testing in production. It's kind of A-B testing and things like that. But there's another passive thing here, and, and kind of I think I don't have a good name for it yet, but because my son's playing this Overwatch game, I decided to call it Overwatch. It's kind of just watching to see is there some weird shit going on that I don't know about. So every day kind of when I when I get to work, I pull on my dashboard and I just look at uh, is there something weird going on here that is, is surprising that I don't know about. And there's this lots of different ways we can approach these things, but uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is observability is, is really the key to making this thing work. And um, it's not something that most teams today take seriously. Uh, if people do have logging, logging is mostly kind of random or left to individual developers to figure out what they want to do and mostly controlled using log levels like, oh, you know, info and error and warning and then you filter out everything because you can't read it and nobody cares about that. But um, we, uh, for me, uh, the big lesson was really to start approaching logging in all the components and everything a lot more uh, structure than to actually design it like an API. And this thing needs to be designed in. Uh, it, it doesn't happen on its own. So um, another kind of really important thing that you know mushrooms uh, help us think about as a metaphor is that mushrooms really glow in clusters. They don't grow or on their own. And um, one of the things that's interesting about that is you if you find one mushroom, you're very, very likely to find other mushrooms close by. And if you find one bug, you're very, very, very likely to find other related bugs close by. And that's an interesting thing because previously I've never really kind of given this too much thought. I find a bug, I fix that bug, and that's it. Now I find a bug and I try start looking at, you know, I, do I have some other similar bugs around this that I didn't understand well? So, for example, um, when I uh, b built this thing originally, I used a third party component for managing user accounts because that was easy to kind of get up. So, provides registration screens, logins through social networks, authentications, all of that, so I can, I can kind of go faster. And then I realized a bunch of registration emails were bouncing as undeliverable. And one of those kind of things um, uh, was because people, I, for whatever reason, you know, don't know their email, or mistype their email, or, or they're distracted, or they're using one hand to type, or the keyboard is bad, or something like that. So I started getting a bunch of these emails coming from uh, gmail.com without a dot that obviously couldn't be delivered. And okay, you know, I, I kind of figured, okay, so I can put some filter there to say, are people having a dot in the domain part of the email? 
But then I started looking a bit more into the logs and figuring out, well, you know, is there other thing happening like this? And then I found gmail.com and stuff like that. You know, people mistyping the domains. And, oh, you know, this couldn't be delivered because com doesn't exist. But then I started getting into kind of, uh, you know, Gmail root that, pff, I don't know why, lots and lots of people type this. There was one case where a popular uh, teacher uh, in Russia promoted the tool in Russian uh, news for teachers, and then as homework, they invited everybody to go and try the thing. 15,000 people came out, came in overnight to try it from Russia. A, a significant portion of them typed Gmail root. That doesn't exist. Looks like a valid domain doesn't exist. And then I started digging a bit deeper, and I realized, well, there's people typing uh, gamilcom and, and gmail.com. These domains exist. One is owned by Google, one is not. And they're both not deliverable for emails. So there's kind of weird stuff going on here, but by looking a bit wider there, by trying to figure out what is the cluster of these bugs that I can then spot from production, I was able to fix this problem in a better way. So I'm testing now, can a domain get delivered messages? If not, I'm warning people to enter the right email. And um, I, uh, I think about 2 to 3% of people trying to register were registering with the wrong email. If you're trying to grow something, Having two to three percent of people who try to register just drop off because they're distracted or they can't type the email is really bad. And, and helping these people on board is wonderful. So um, this is a massive, massive business uh, improvement based on figuring out what the bug clusters were. So anyway, um, back to the topic of mushrooms, and I, I you know, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about this again. The biggest mushroom in the world, no, not a cloud, but the biggest proper mushroom, is called a humongous fungus. It has a name, and humongous fungus is 10 square kilometers big. It's a, it's a single living organism, the largest single living organism in the world. It, the estimated weight is 35,000 ton, and it's the, in this place called Malheur National Forest in Oregon in the U.S. It's, you can type humongous fungus into Google Maps and it finds it. It's, it's kind of a massive forest there. And um, very, much, very much like this humongous fungus that kind of just covers the whole thing and you don't know where it starts, where it ends. The big problem when we start um, looking for clusters is that we need a lot of data. But when we have a lot of data, it becomes very difficult to manage. It becomes, you know, you, you don't see the mushroom because of the forest and you don't see the forest because of the mushroom anymore. So here's another screenshot from my logging tool. Like, font intentionally small, it doesn't really, and this is like um, maybe a two minute frame generated from random shit happening in, in, in production. And this particular one is a content security policy logger. Content security policies are a browser security feature where you can tell the browser using the website headers where it's allowed to load scripts and, and CSS from and things like that. So you can lock down the website like that. It's very, 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 very tricky to get right because different browsers support different things uh, and when people's stuff gets blocked on the client, you don't really know about that because the browser will pull the file and then block it. So browsers provide this feedback system where they will give you data about what they've blocked. And this is kind of you know, the stuff that's blocked. And uh, if I zoom into one of these things, uh, you probably can't read this, but it says windows.symbol for Mario Post Control. I, I have nothing called Mario Post Control in my software. And this is a JavaScript error where something exploded. Now, not my software, but one of my users of my software cannot use my software because of that. So still, my problem. And um, th this turns out to be some kind of buggy Chrome extension that, or Firefox extension that people have installed. And people just install random shit. You can't stop them. And you know the software doesn't work because they've installed random shit, but they, they blame your software for that. And it starts interacting with your software in weird ways. And I think one of the kind of biggest problems with something like this is some of these errors, like 99.99999, you can safely ignore. Because it prevented some custom style sheet from loading from some custom extensions. So my website broke their extension. Who cares? It's not even supposed to work with my website. But this, you know, 0.001% I really want to know about. And um, the biggest kind of challenge for observability is separating the signal from noise. Once we start collecting a ton of data, managing that data becomes 
a big problem. And this is where um, kind of we need to start looking at tooling because tooling becomes critical for this. Luckily, um, you know, observability tools are popping up like mushrooms, so there's new one every day. Um, and you can, uh, you know, there's open source, there's commercial, there's lots of stuff you can do. I, I've randomly pulled out some tools I know about, there's probably a lot more. So you can investigate these things. Um, and this space is totally exploding at the moment. A month ago, Cisco decided to get in on the game. And when companies like Cisco start getting in on the game, you know that the space is exploding. So Cisco bought one of these companies, Epsagon, for $500 million. Why uh, a thing that analyzes logs is worth $500 million is beyond me, but Somebody sold it, so you know. Good luck to them. Um, but generally, I think uh, good tools become really necessary for something like this. And this is where again those agile testing quadrants, where we have you know manual and tooling, does no longer works because we need a mix of tools and human involvement here to really figure out what's going on. We need the tool to collect and filter and, and tell me that this is uh, an anomaly. And then I can look at it and say, well, this anomaly I don't care about, or this anomaly is really important. So what these tools will do for you is um, help you harvest a ton of data, and then help you ignore most of it, because it's not important. And help you query and analyze the stuff that's important, help you show uh, aggregates, help you show anomalies, and that becomes really, really wonderful for time saving if, if you want to optimize your time doing that. And um, Kind of going back to the topic of mushrooms, because that's what you hear to hear about. That's what you are here to hear about, not kind of software stuff. Um, one of the kind of interesting things about mushrooms is these crazy uncles that are going around collecting mushrooms on the hills. They're always going to tell us, you know, how mushroom. You know, some of these mushrooms are wonderful. And I remember. I was in Hong Kong at a conference uh, a couple of years ago, and flying back at the airport, there was a there was an um, alternative medicine shop that was selling stuff and my wife loves alternative medicine and I, I kind of buy her things like that just to tease her so I, I went in to see you know what can I buy in Hong Kong and they tried to ask me like okay does she have a problem with the liver or does she have a problem with breathing or it's like no she doesn't really have any problems you know and I said, oh okay total health so they gave me this um, uh, kind of can that says total health and uh, the, the can was full of uh, some mushroom uh, called um, Hericulum erineus or uh, lion's mane. And lion's mane looks like this. It looks like kind of lion's hair. It's also called monkey beard. It has a ton of kind of weird names. And if you talk to these crazy mushroom people, they tell it is the healthiest thing in the world. So they, they'll quote, you know, on the internet you can see that it's a good cure for depression, it's a good cure for blood pressure problems, it's a good cure for um, all sorts of um, total health things, you know, and, and there's kind of unconfirmed stuff where it actually cures cancers as well. Wikipedia says there's literally no scientific research to prove any of that. But, you know, some of this stuff is, is potentially good for us. And at the end of the day, you know, champignons are, are, are nice to eat in, on a pizza. So we need to kind of figure out um, which of these things are actually great for us, which of these things are not great for us. Because some of the surprises we find, if we know where to look, are really, really important. Um, so, for example, this tool I'm building, originally I built it for myself, so the input was Markdown. And you could create a video by, you know, creating a markdown file and then it builds everything for you. And um, uh, uh, experimenting a bit with users, I offered people a way to do it from a PowerPoint as well. Where you kind of type in stuff you want the video to say in the speaker notes, you, you upload the PowerPoint, it does everything for you. And I was testing a bug that I, oh, in, in routing, and I put some observability in to track the tasks. And I was looking at the timing. I was looking at a lot of interesting other stuff. But I also randomly logged the type of a task is being executed. No, not uh, logged the type of a task being executed. And to my big surprise, after about two days, 95% of the tasks being executed were PowerPoints. 5% were Markdown. You know, thinking about it now, it's perfectly reasonable. More people use PowerPoint than Markdown. But the whole product was organized around Markdown. So I decided, let's revamp the website and you know, paid somebody to rebuild the whole thing to focus more on PowerPoints. And this really helped the business. And this is one of those weird things I've discovered fixing a bug. 
because I put in some observability for that. So when we look at um, uh, testing in production, we look at the, the, the stuff that falls off the map, really what's interesting is that I can make assumptions as much as I want. Or in your teams, your product managers, your business analysts, your, 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 your customer representatives can make assumptions as much as they want. But we don't really have a high confidence in any of that until we get hit by a lot of real traffic. We, with a lot of real traffic, we get high confidence. And this is where um, these production-oriented tests can help us to um, resolve things we're not confident about. Even if it's well, you know, a thing we could potentially test before deployment, um, if we can't agree or if there's no high confidence, then deploying and testing in production is probably one of the safest ways to do that. So, at the same time, like with mushrooms, if we talk about deploying stuff to see what's going to happen, the big problem we have is how do we know it's safe, in, uh, safe enough to try? Because kind of for most of the forest stuff, again, too much time spent on research, uh, there's this kind of eating test where you can just kind of move it around the tongue for a couple of minutes, and if your tongue burns, it's probably not safe enough to eat. If your tongue doesn't burn, it's probably safe enough to eat. With the big exception on all the sites I found, never, ever, 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 ever try this on mushrooms. There's kind of, some mushrooms are gonna start affecting your nervous system like seconds after you put it on the tongue and you won't even know that it's burning your tongue and it's gonna kill you very quickly after that. And um, so this is dangerous and, and, and releasing stuff on production that could potentially bring the whole thing down or, or create big business problems is dangerous. And, and the question is how do we manage that risk? And by the way, this is a, um, uh, a uh, death cup. The, the most dangerous mushroom in the world. It's responsible for almost 90% of, of deaths from mushrooms, but it looks really kind of, you know, like a normal mushroom, doesn't it? And um, the, the way it works is it kills you over four to nine days. And you don't even know it started killing you by the time it started killing you. And a lot of people have, lots of people that suffer from this have a problem that when they get to the hospital, the hospital cannot diagnose them well because the symptoms are kind of random organ failure. It starts affecting the nervous system, it starts affecting the organs, and hospitals usually spend a lot of time testing for stuff they don't need to test for, because they're trying to figure out what went wrong, and people don't admit they've been eating wild mushrooms, because they're embarrassed about that. So um, the, 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 the big problem uh, with, with this kind of stuff is, again, some of these mushrooms take four months to kind of kill you. You don't even know that something's wrong. Some of them are working quickly. And uh, yes, we could potentially you know, test in production, but when do we know when to stop and, and when the test is good or not? And there's some really interesting, new, exciting development in the mushroom world that everybody was kind of totally excited about in 2004 and last year as well. And th this is kind of new tech that lets people um, actively test or almost with 100% certainty whether a mushroom is poisonous or not. And I am not shitting you. In 2004, they, are using, they were using PCR testing to figure out whether mushrooms are poisonous or not. So there's, um, and, and this test was evolved by the uh, American uh, Research Service of the US Department of Agri uh, Agriculture. And in 2004, they were using PCR tests to figure out will mushrooms are these mushrooms poisonous for plants? They were not able to test for human stuff, but last year they've developed a lateral flow test. Again, I'm not joking, there's a kind of, I can send you the links for this, that can test very quickly, very rapidly. It was a rapid test, like the you know, corona uh, lateral flow test, that can test for um, uh, mushrooms that are poisonous to humans and to animals. And, um, there's a couple of suggestions how to use this. One of the suggestions was when they bring somebody to a hospital to quickly you know, diagnose whether they've been poisoned by a mushroom or not. And the other one was to kind of bring a dog along. And if you don't know if you can eat a mushroom or not, give it to the dog and then test the dog using that kind of uh, lateral flow test. And um, you know, the dog might die some weeks later, but you will know immediately if it's safe or not to eat. That's very unfortunate for the dog, but it opens up some interesting possibilities for us. And, and likewise, kind of with software, you know, new uh, software tools 
are allowing us to reduce the risk of testing in production like this. And yes, not, not, not maybe on dogs, but on some unfortunate users, unfortunately. But th there's ways of managing this risk. So one of the tools that I uh, like to use uh, is kind of a um, uh, canary deployment or gradual deployment. And the, most of the kind of cloud providers now have tools like this. This is a picture from Amazon. The tool is called Code Deploy. And it kind of automates the whole business of creating multiple versions of your application and then sending a percentage of the traffic to uh, the new version, monitoring for it. And then uh, you can set up multiple algorithms for doing this. And you can say something like, well, um, Start from 10% and every hour, every two hours, every five minutes, give it 10 more percent if no, nothing horrible happens. And if something horrible happens, just roll back. And this was something where uh, you could only do if you were Google or Facebook or Amazon five years ago. Now it's accessible to almost everybody. And that's what I meant by new tech that's kind of helping us do these things. And it's really worth investing in this stuff because if we've built up observability, if we can detect horrible stuff happening, even if we don't know what the horrible stuff is, then we can use these things to potentially reduce the risk of what we're doing. So um, one of the big questions that's kind of parallel to the question I asked before, like the first question was, can we detect if this is any different from a random network problem? Remember that users are used to random network problems now all the time. So the big question is, when you deploy something and test on users, can the users detect if this is any different from a random network problem? And if not, it's brilliant. We can test around, you know, lots of interesting stuff there they don't even know we're testing. And uh, you know, people are used to flaky Wi-Fi's, they're used to kind of things exploding, they're used to potential problems and, and reloading the page. And by the time when they reload the page, if I've already fixed the problem of the machine rolled back, that's Perfectly fine, so we've reduced this risk. And there's a couple of things that we can do to bring the risk to be kind of acceptable. And it's a big question, what is acceptable risk of us? Um, the first thing we can do is we can do small, quick deliveries. Uh, the, the, the quicker you do deliveries, the smaller the changes, the less risk that we're gonna break something horrible. Plus, if we're doing small, quick deliveries, um, the important aspect of that is that we're changing one thing at a time. So if I break something, I know what's broken it. I, I don't necessarily know what the bug is if it interacts with a ton of other stuff, but I know what I've done to break it so I can roll back. Likewise, quick rollbacks are really important there and easy rollbacks, and that's what these, again, tools provide. Because they're running multiple versions, they can very quickly switch traffic and, and things like that. That's why it's worth investing in the tools. And if we can offer like a quick fix with gradually releasing, then people won't know what happened. And once I've realized this, I started doing lots and lots and lots of stuff like this because it helps me not spend time on things that are expensive to test before production or that I don't have confidence. If I just release it and see what happens and very quickly kind of act on, on potential problems, that becomes really, really useful. So kind of this is uh, the, the massive opportunity that testing in production brings. We can take stuff that's expensive, that's important, impossible, that's difficult to test uh, using traditional methods and take it live and test it in production as long as we can manage the risk. And for that, we need a bunch of observability techniques, we need a bunch of other tools, we need to maybe change some deployment practices, but the opportunities are fantastic because we have real traffic that we can trust. And um, j just as a very stupid example, I. Um, kind of every large company I've ever worked with as a consultant had problems with performance testing. Because the staging and, and, and the testing environments are never really a replica of the full production environment because the full production environment costs too much to kind of replicate. And then the full production environment has wonderful storage and it's CPU bound, but the staging environment is running on a regular hard disk, so it's IO bound. And whatever people do to test there, it's kind of just not relevant until it goes live. And then they have these massively expensive quarterly or, or six monthly production testing specialist cycles and things like that. But what if we did kind of quick small releases and just monitored production? 
it's a lot cheaper if we can manage that risk and if we can roll back quickly. And that's kind of um, part of this, and part of it is really looking for those business wins and, and, and uh, business benefits that we can extract from stuff that we cannot test without real users. So that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for, for uh, staying here, and I hope it wasn't like too hot for, for the group with cheaper tickets. Um, and uh, if you want to uh, kind of read up on, I occasionally post about this stuff on my blog. If you want to check out the tool I'm building, it's uh, neraki.com. Thanks very much.